In the last five years, our nation has been trying out a new thing. It's not actually a terribly new thing, but um, certainly new in the way it's taken over um, our national dialogue. And it's this outrage culture. It's dig into your hatred. There's a lot of power there. Um, you know, the internet <laughs> six years ago was full of cat memes and all that kind of stuff. And now it's just hatred and accusations and wow, right? We've just tried out this experiment. What if we just really poured into the power of hate? But I think most people underestimate the power of love. I would argue that it's the most powerful force on earth. Jesus sure thought so. His whole ministry and his whole motivation was around love. Well, you know, even romantic love has amazing power. A lot of you men or boys may be able to relate to the kind of things that drive you to pour out your love to win the heart of a girlfriend or a wife. Uh, you, you may know that power. I remember as a poor college student, uh, I came across some free flower bulbs that my family uh, was offering. And I made up a gift for Heather for Valentine's 1993. There was a red amaryllis that was going to grow out and some paper whites. And, and we've been dating for about four months, but, but not trying to lock in like we're the only ones. But basically, we were non-exclusively dating only each other since October as freshmen at Seattle Pacific University. And I was super poor. Yeah, but I had to figure out how to communicate this. So I wrote a card that the paper whites were because white is her favorite color. And the red amaryllis is for Valentine's Day. <laughs> it was too soon to say, for love. It was for love. Uh, we still use that line. Yeah, the red is for um, mm, 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 Valentine's Day. But just weeks later, on April Fool's Day, my courageous, foolish self, and there's a line there somewhere, right? <laughs> I called Heather's dad, Bob, and left a voicemail asking for her hand in marriage. Right, this, is, this, is, this is early on. Things are moving pretty fast, I guess, except for April Fool's, right? That got handed back to me in spades when Bob and his two sisters all left individual voicemails for me on my dorm phone to inquire about my suitability to be a husband, right? They're playing my bluff and just going for it. What kind of car did I drive, Said asked one. Um, what kind of watch did I wear? Uh, what, how many stamps in my passport, asked another. And I'm like, oh, well, I, 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 ride, I ride a bike around. And no, no watch either, uh, no stamps and uh, passport. Um, yeah, I don't actually even have a passport. <laughs> I'm not sure how sacrificial any of those actions were. Some of that was just dumb love and just ready to, ready to try to um, step into this relationship and and but try to be careful, but sort of not. Um, but I've learned to to know that love requires sacrifice. It shows itself in sacrifice. In rearing kids and loving one another and caring for the community, uh, man, it takes everything you've got to be that kind of person in sacrificial love. You know, we'll, we'll gladly pay any price in order to demonstrate how much we care, right, in those situations. Love is powerful. It moves us to do amazing things. And before there ever was a, a Resurrection Sunday, there was a Good Friday. Uh, before there ever was uh, a Resurrection, there first had to be a death. And so I just want to communicate three things today. The first thing is that there can only be one King. The love that the King has poured out to us shows that he is that one King. For, for 33 years, Jesus the Messiah walked the earth while serving the hungry, healing the broken, delivering the oppressed. He announced the coming of the kingdom of God, that God was going to do this new thing. God was going to arrive and actually accomplish rulership on the earth and, and restore all these things. Jesus claimed to be the son of God. And many believed him to be the true king of all things. 
And this kind of thinking and teaching caused a lot of conflict in the area Jesus served in. See, in, in that time, the ruler of the ancient Near East was Rome. And Rome had installed a king, a vassal king, who was in, you know, reported back to them, named Herod the Great, to keep things in Israel under control. Herod the Great was just basically a warlord. He wasn't particularly religious, wasn't really even particularly Jewish. He was just the strongest man to keep the pressure on the Jewish people and do things. Um, and he was a tyrant, as you would expect, and constantly afraid that his authority would be undermined. Another potential king arriving in the city of Jerusalem would be a threat to Roman rule and therefore to Herod himself. He had to be put away. And Herod and Jesus could not rule over the same Israel. And Jesus willingly put a target on his back marches into Jerusalem. Um, he rides on, on a donkey, as we learned on Palm Sunday. Um, and he lures the human authorities, but also the dark forces behind them. Because he intends to absorb the pain to bring our sin and bring our punishment onto himself. To do that for Israel, because Israel was in uh, rebellion against God. They had not sought out the true God. They did not even welcome the king when he arrived. And to do that work for us. So the religious rulers uh, and the Roman centurions worked together to have Jesus arrested. He was brought to trial for his claims to be God. He's the one that says he's God. They made up other false charges, but ultimately it was because he claimed he was the anointed one of God, the very presence of God among the people that they said, we got to get rid of him. He was convicted and then beaten nearly to death. And then he was forced to carry a rugged wooden cross to the hill that he would be killed upon. Matthew 27, verse 32 and following. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, that's North Africa, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, insurrectionists, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple, that was part of the the charges brought against him that Jesus himself was going to destroy the temple. Um, you said, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. You see, this, this crucifixion was just marked by ridicule and disbelief. The soldiers mocking Jesus place a sign over his head calling him the king of the Jews, even though they didn't believe he was the king of the Jews. But this is what happens to people who think that they can come in and step in and call themselves the king of the Jews. And the insurrectionists next to him, those who had uh, tried to overthrow through some violent act, were crucified alongside him. Those who passed by, Jesus mocked him, telling him to save himself if he really was the Son of God. And the priests and the teachers mocked Jesus by telling him to get off the cross if he really was the King of Israel. And they, they didn't understand that God was coming to be King here, to take up 
the cries of his people, to become truly king among them, to support and encourage and, and shelter and, and love them. And they rejected him and crucified him. None of them understood that the true test of Jesus' power and authority was not in his ability to save himself from crucifixion, but in his ability to be crucified, to, to give of himself in that sacrificial way, and then overcome the death that would be the result of this crucifixion. They had no idea. And, and sometimes we miss the proof of Jesus' lordship, that he truly is Lord, because we're expecting him to prove himself in certain ways. You, you've done that, right? God, I'll believe in you if. I'll believe in you if. And then he does something different. Ah. Some of you are looking for more proof, but you're still uncertain what would convince you. Some of you have something very specific in mind. Uh, many have, have decided that, that I will never trust Jesus unless you meet my expectations. Unless Jesus heals their relative, gives them the job, stops world hunger, or writes something in the sky. They'll never trust him and obey his authority in their lives. They can never allow themselves to see him as king unless he does what they want him to do. I'm afraid that this kind of mentality is, is what plagued the people there at the time of Jesus' death. And it drove Herod to be part of the death of God's son. And when we demand Jesus prove himself on our terms, we rob ourselves of seeing his, his love and his work in our own lives. But Herod wasn't the last one to be threatened by the kingship of Jesus. He wasn't the last one to struggle with this idea of Jesus being in charge. <laughs> right? Truth be told, that's our problem right now, today. His claim to be king rattles our cages. Because we are the kings. That's what we've been taught. You have authority. You look inside yourself. You, you be you. You do you. You just run your world. And maybe you run it into the ground, but you at least run it. Yeah, I'm in charge. We've got our phones. We walk around with like little scepters calling food and, and those brown and blue and, and white trucks to our house to give us things and, and entertain us. And we live like kings. But the truth is in our lives, there can only be one king. Right. One king. It's been said that the, the, in the throne of our own hearts sits the one who reigns in our lives. In the driver's seat. In control. And you've got to choose whether that's going to be Jesus or it's going to be you. Are you going to sit down in the chair all by yourself and say, I am in charge? Because when we're on the throne of our hearts, we make the decisions based on what we want. And we want what we want. And that's selfish. The other choice is to have Jesus on the throne of our lives, right? When Jesus is on the throne of our lives, love reigns. Oh, don't we want that? The most powerful thing on earth to reign in our life and through our life. We, we listen to his leading. We put others first. We live sacrificially. That's actually what changes the world. So when it comes to the way you speak and act and live, there can be only one king. And if Jesus is dead, none of this matters, right? But if he rose from the dead, then that changes everything. He is king, right? There can only be one king. The second thing I want to communicate to you is that love overcame death. It did then and it does now. Love overcame death. Three days after Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb, to everyone's amazement, and shock. He appeared in bodily form to many of the disciples and, and, and others. And this had never happened before. They had seen him killed. They knew he was dead. And now he was eating with them, walking with them, talking with them. We have all these eyewitness accounts of, of his resurrected body having a different sort of nature to it. Kind of a beyond human, but, but clearly human uh, walking through walls, but still eating food.
fish and eating breakfast with them, right? This new creation, this new body, the thing that we actually look forward to. Jesus' love for humanity and, and God's power to accomplish this has um, overcome death and defeated evil once and for all. His resurrection is proof that he indeed is the true king over all. Gustave Doré, the artist um, that I've been showing you pictures of, uh, was a renowned illustrator, engraver, painter, sculptor in the, in the mid-1800s. Well, he was going through Europe and lost his passport. Uh, well, at least he had a passport, right? Um, unlike I did. Uh, but so he's traveling through Europe and he didn't have his passport. He comes to a border crossing and he's trying to explain his predicament to one of the guards. And he says, I'm Paul Gustave Doré. And he hoped that they would recognize him and allow him to pass. And the guard's like, um, a lot of people try to cross saying there's somebody that they're not. So I need you to show me some proof. And so Doré insisted, I'm the man I claim to be. And I, I, I really am me. And he says, all right. We'll give you a test, and if you pass it, we'll allow you to go through. So what does he do? He hands him a pencil and a sheet of paper, and he tells Doré to sketch several people standing nearby. And Doré did it so quickly and so skillfully, the guard was convinced that he was indeed this renowned artist. He was who he claimed to be. His work confirmed his word, right? His work confirmed his word. And Jesus' work confirmed his word. God raised him from the dead. Though many had doubted him and mocked him, death did not have the last word and the final say. Actually, love had the final word. You, you know this scripture, and, and maybe you can even just quote it with me, but from John 3, 16, where God loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have Life of the ages, eternal life. God didn't send a son in the world to condemn the world, but, but to save it, right? Now, some of us have an, an idea that God actually doesn't love anybody. He hates us. The way, the way you would hear some preaching would be, um, God so hated the world that he killed his only son. And that's the story, right? But no, no, no. It's God loved the world, and this is how he poured out his love. He sent Jesus to live the life we couldn't live and die the death we should have died. And when we put our faith and hope and trust in Jesus' life, his death, right, his, his work, his resurrection, we'll be saved. And that's why we celebrate today. That's the only reason we have to celebrate is because we've been given the opportunity for eternal life. Do you hear me? We know that because of Jesus, the worst thing that will happen to us, the very worst thing, will not be the last thing that happens to us. We, we fear death, but, but that's not the last word. We will experience resurrection and new life in new creation. We'll get our bodies back, but version 2.0, like Jesus' body. And after Jesus has, had uh, resurrected, his final words to his followers show the truth behind the Easter story. It's interesting, in, in Matthew chapter 28, Verse 16 and following the 11 disciples now, because Judas had, had killed himself over his betrayal of Jesus. Don't, don't go there. There's always hope. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But, but some doubted. Oh, who doubted? Oh, probably, no, it's just the 11. <laughs> just the disciples. There's room for you at the feet of Jesus today. They, he had resurrected, and some mm, kind of still doubted. Then he says, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? All authority. Kingship? Yeah. Uh, over the dark forces? Absolutely. Over the kings of the earth? Yes. So in heaven and on earth, the divine space and the human space, all authority has been given to Jesus. That is a claim. What are you going to do with that claim? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so go and make disciples of all the nations. Disciples. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And look, I'm going to be with you until the end of the age. The last words of Jesus in the book of Matthew after he had uh, raised from the dead. Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is the day that Jesus was given all authority in heaven and on earth. No matter how many doubted him, he is the king of the Jews. No matter how many mocked him, he was able to rescue himself. God raised him from the dead. And he's able to rescue the entire world as well. In fact, that's his goal is to take all the nations and bring them back to God. No matter how many questioned his power, he did defeat the cross. Defeated death once and for all. It's the love of God that's the authority that was, is now reigning over the entire world. And obviously our lives included as well. And his final instruction for all his followers to go into the world and make disciples. Spread the good news of his resurrection and his love to all who are going to listen. We've, we've been invited to teach the way of Jesus because it changes the world. The story of Jesus changes lives. It changes the world. So how does it change the world? Maybe you've lost sight of that power. The gospel has power, the power of God. What is the story that Jesus the Christ is king? Jesus, the son of David, is the king of kings and lord of lords. How does that change a life? Well, this is the third thing, because it lets love reign in you. And, and that's what you need to allow, is to let love reign in you today. Today, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, this instruction is given to you. You're supposed to be part of making disciples. Um, disciple, that, that word in, uh, in Greek really just means like a learner or a student. Right? We're supposed to allow ourselves to be students and learners of the way of Christ. And what is the way of Christ? Self-giving, self-sacrificial, fully committed love. That's going to change the world. And we're helping others become students and learners of that as well. It, it goes in, in order, in, in a progression, moving out into the world. And it needs to start in your household too. To be a disciple, a learner, an apprentice is to be in a lifelong process of becoming more like Jesus. And he does this because he's the one on the throne. Don't think you've got to steer your course through this. Just allow him to be the king. Over time, we, we learn to live generous lives. We, we learn to forgive, to serve others, to practice self-control, to be people of peace. Not hatred and vitriol and outrage, but peace. When we submit to the love of Jesus in our lives, we're compelled to live like him. And to invite others to join us. That's what it means to let love reign in us. We're a school of apprentices to Jesus. Okay, Jesus, you're the master. Teach me the way. I want to know the way of love. It's the most powerful force. I want to know it in my own life. And here's a pro tip for some of you. Well, for all of you. Read some of the Jesus story with some other people. Seems simple enough, right? But it's seriously a pro tip. Here's the deal. Read some of the eyewitness accounts of his life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And, and ask together, what would it look like to follow this Jesus? Not the one you've seen on the internet, the one you've seen in the meme, not the one maybe even learned in Sunday school, but the Jesus of the Bible. What would it look like to follow this Jesus? Second question, what would it look like to obey Jesus together? Wow, if this is the way he is and lives and loves, and if this is the way he forgives, and this is the way he heals, and this is the way he serves, then how could we do that together? So, what would it look like to follow Jesus? What would it look like to obey Jesus together? And then the third question, what would it look like to obey Jesus in front of people that don't follow him yet? So that we could put on display and maybe work alongside those, for a good cause, but work alongside those people so that they can see God's love in action. Personally, I've found it essential to have others with me as I follow Jesus. 
after Jesus got a hold of my heart at age 18, I started turning things over to him. Sometimes in batches, you know, like, here, okay, take all that. But often one disordered desire after another. Disordered desire, you know that, right? I mean, it's good to, it's good to love. It's good to, to um, pursue a mate. That's great. But lust and all those other things, no, that's not good. It's, it's good to want to earn money, but oh, the greed that comes in there, right? These disordered desires, these ones that have, have started out as good things and turned into um, idols, turned into demonic things. Those disordered desires, I turn over one by one. And I realized uh, pretty quick <laughs> that I needed a community because I had spiritual ADD. Spiritual ADD, attention deficit disorder. I needed to be open with others about even my lack of desire to follow Jesus in certain areas. Just say, guys, I'm not feeling it. I don't want to. I, I want to want to want to follow Jesus, but could you help me move to just to want to want and then to want to follow Jesus? Can I need help. I need encouragement. I need to let you seem to have courage. Let me borrow your courage. I, I can say without any reservation that in this process, acknowledging Jesus as King is, as King is the best thing you can do. The, be, the best thing you can do. Allegiance to Jesus in a community of other loyal followers is the only way to survive. It's the only way for love to pour in you and then through you to a watching world. It's the only way. Consider connecting with a group of people and do that pro tip of reading Jesus together. That might just be the local church, which of course, that's awesome. So, so join a local church, be a part of a people who are taking seriously the claims of Jesus to be king and asking him to pour out his amazing love through you as a group. And the final reminder that we're given by Jesus before he ascends into heaven is that he's going to be with us to the very end. Maybe the bitter end, and maybe you feel like God's forgotten about you. And I want to remind you that he hasn't. <laughs> You're not alone. He sees you. He knows what's going on. And inside of those who trust him, those who have pledged allegiance to King Jesus, he lives and dwells inside of us by the power of, of the Holy Spirit. So no matter what you go through and no matter what you face, you're not alone. Now, some of you have never even made the decision to let love reign in your life and, and to follow Jesus. Maybe you've been waiting for Jesus to prove himself to you. Come on, Jesus, show up. Maybe you've been waiting um, for, for that impressive display of God that overwhelms your senses instead of just giving up control of your life. You've never submitted to Jesus. He's the king, right? Today, I just want to invite you to give your life to Jesus. Give him your heart. Become a, a disciple, a student of his for the rest of your life. You might be feeling him ask you to stop your own path towards self-destruction. That throne of yours is like the driver's seat and you've been just crashing. You might feel him asking you to just turn this around and head toward him and allow him to let love reign from the throne of your life. I suggest you start a conversation with him. And yield to that love. He is the king. But you know this because you've done it. You can resist him for a while at your own peril. right? So reach out to me, to, to our church. Uh, we would love to walk with you through this. Some of you have trusted in Jesus, but have grown tired of obeying him. Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah. I think I've got enough. I think I got my ticket to heaven, didn't I? Isn't that what the preacher said? I could just accept and receive and then be done? No. Let love reign in your life. You've strayed from him. You've lived for yourself, maybe. And, and Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, reminds us that we can once again repent and obey. If that's you today, I just want to remind you that Jesus isn't going to leave you. He still loves you. He's with you. Commit, again, just to live for him. Put him, again, on the throne of your life. And so this Easter, may you see the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the proof of his love. And let love reign in your life.
May you join God in spreading this good news with the entire world because he is risen.